hello, yes, uh, I am Tim. Uh, I'm a software developer by day and I'm an event organizer also by the same days actually, but work, don't know about that one. Uh, I'm joking. <laughs> um, okay, yes, and I'm talking about anti-immersion. Uh, it's not massively a thing, to be honest, but I think it should be a thing. Uh, so that's what I'm going to be talking about. Uh, okay, so uh, a bit of background. Like, uh, for a long time, uh, people said that films should be entertaining. Uh, they should be all, uh, yeah, you had like your comedy, your dramas, but drama tended to be melodrama for quite a long time. And it was all about people meant to leave, you know, feeling good at the end. I mean, like, that's not saying that they were bad. I mean, Charlie Chaplin's slapstick films, uh, I watched some of them quite recently, actually, uh, to get inspiration for, for a show. And they're, they're brilliant, they're hilarious, they're the best thing. Um, but however, you know, film progressed a little bit, it, it grew up a little bit, and then you had films exploring sort of uh, more realistic portrayals of drama, more, more natural styles. And I don't think that many people would say that uh, Schindler's List would be greatly improved by Schindler taking a pie in the face <laughs> halfway through, or, or, or doing a ladder gag routine with an SS officer. Uh, so also for a long time, people said that games should be fun. Uh, that's, what, that's what games are meant to be. They're meant to be entertaining. They're meant to be, meant to be all about fun. And obviously, fun is subjective, and it, and it depends on who you are. But, uh, for example, a game for me that I found very fun, Shadow of Mordor. I, I, I love that game. I really do. Uh, Jake, stop playing with things. <laughs> I, really, I really love Shadow of Mordor. Uh, despite all the problem with its plot, which was atrocious, and the, the really worrying themes in it, uh, actually, uh, something that actually ties into a previous talk that I've given at Video Brains on, uh, on bugs and, and how they affect your interpretation of the game, in fact. Uh, Austin Walker wrote a, a really interesting piece about Shadow of Mordor, uh, discussing about how it's got these incongruities where it tries to humanise the orcs, but at the same time it's saying, oh, you can enslave them, they're just orcs, who cares? So this, this horrifying thing, he found it really particularly worrying that these orcs who had these lives, once you uh, enslave them to do your will with the, with the wraith powers, they just, they just stopped having these lives. You know, they never had any of these feasts or the hunts, they just, they just stopped doing anything. But in my game, they, they were still having, having these feasts and they still had a life. So to me, it didn't seem quite as bad, but I thought that was just a, a small aside. Uh, but I found Shadow of Mordor incredibly fun. However, games have also started uh, exploring more negative emotions. Uh, so games like Spec Ops The Line, for example, is, is not so much a game uh, you play as a game you endure. Um, and uh, Papers, Please, also a game where the, that the main sort of gameplay of Papers, Please is about sifting through, through papers looking for incongruities. Unless you're some kind of weirdo like me, uh, it's not massively fun. Or most people wouldn't say that's massively fun. However, I've never felt or a game has never made me feel so singularly appalled in myself uh, as in the middle of one of these levels uh, there was an attack on my, on my checkpoint and several guards who, who I'd been talking to and several civilians were, were killed in this horrible attack and my initial thought was, well, there goes half a day's pay. <laughs> so game is going up. Um, however, a lot of people say that games should be immersive. We see this a lot. Game, games are about escapism and they're, they're meant to be immersive. You're meant to be immersed within games. And we, we see this all the time. Games always talk about, oh, they're the most immersive experiences. It's all about being drawn into worlds. Even games such as uh, Dragon Ball Xenoverse, which, as far as I can tell, is, is author insert fan fiction uh, about Dragon Ball, it says that it, it, it sells itself on being immersive. And that seems kind of odd. Now, certainly not all games say they need to be immersive. You know, abstract puzzle games or things like that. Uh, generally, they don't build themselves in immersion, but a lot of games seem to strive towards immersion if they're the big mainstream AAA. But I don't think that necessarily all games do need to be immersive. <coughs> Just a second. So firstly, uh, it's probably good to talk about what we mean when we say immersion. What most AAA game studios seem to think immersion means is, oh, look at... You can see Geralt's beard hair is growing in real time. It's so immersive because his beard is growing and there's, you can see every pore on their face. Or, or, or now when we move on to, or to virtual reality, it's, it's so immersive because you're there and they've got this, this weird harness thing so you, can, so you can walk around or you've got to be immersed because you're actually walking. But that's not necessarily the case, especially with the, with the VR example. VR doesn't inherently make something more immersive. Certainly it can improve immersion if you feel you're there, but as uh, Rob Morgan, who has spoken at video games uh, previously, has said, uh, immersion is, is about emotion, not about the real. It's about emotionally connecting with these characters 
that being to the point that you you know you believe they exist. You can suspend all of your disbelief that, that, that this is just a game uh, and, until you really feel like, yeah, these are people I connect with and such. Uh, right, so the point at which this now ties in uh, with theatre is uh, this, this idea about immersion is something that, that comes up in theatre. In particular, there was a style uh, created uh, by one man, uh, Konstantin Stanislavski. Now, his method uh, of, of theatre... Uh, he had this idea that when, when you're acting, the actor should become the character. They should identify completely with the character until you're not you on stage being this person. You are the character on stage. The idea being that then the audience would relate to these characters through these believable emotions that they're seeing and they, they would be immersed within the theatre. Uh, sort of, uh, to, to, to do this, uh, he had this idea of this emotional memory, the idea that actors should, should have this sort of well of emotions and they should understand how people react in, in these situations so that they can portray believable immersions. Uh, now, now, some of you may be familiar with uh, method acting, uh, for example, that this idea that to gain these, uh, these emotional memories, you, you go out and you, you just experience them. I think uh, Daniel Day-Lewis is probably quite a, quite a familiar example of a method actor uh, who I think while he's filming uh, Gangs of New York, uh, he, he got pneumonia during the film of that and then refused treatment uh, because treatment for that would not have been period appropriate. Mm -hmm. uh, and all these things, and, and like um, uh, Christian Bale, who, who dropped like five stone for the machinist just because he wanted to, to understand what it was like uh, for this. Um, however, there was, a, there, was, there was a different style, uh, which isn't quite, quite as often used. Uh, and that was popularised by a man uh, called Bertolt Brecht. <coughs> Now, uh, Brecht didn't agree with this, this, this naturalistic style. Uh, so you see, he thought the problem with this, the idea that uh, the audience uh, connect with the characters, they, had, they, they experience this arc, and there's this emotional catharsis at the end, and everyone's satisfied, and oh yes, wasn't that wonderful, oh it was very moving, very stirring, and then they go and then they forget about it because that's it. Uh, he didn't agree with that sort of idea of connecting with it. Uh, uh, he proposed a different style, this idea that uh, the audience should never, can, they should always be aware that they are watching a show. There should never be this immersion within the theatre. They, they should never feel that, uh, that, you know, they're watching a scene playing out of somebody's lives. They should always be, yes, these are actors on a stage, they are play, portraying characters. Uh, the reasons for this, uh, in particular, he thought that uh, theatre should be, almost, or could be, a political platform, almost. Uh, and this idea that uh, by, by distancing the audience from the characters, it allows you to remain critical of what's happening before you. And then while you're in this uh, critical uh, mindset, uh, it then encourages you to, to go forth from the theatre and effect change, uh, were his words. Uh, this idea that, you know, he wanted to use the, the theatrical pieces to, to point out injustices and such in the world, and then, but keep people thinking about this and then encourage them to, to change them. They agreed that these were indeed injustices. Uh, well, the method uh, through which he did this uh, was known as epic theatre. Uh, the principal um, sort of technique behind this was, uh, I'm going to get this wrong, uh, uh, the verb from... <laughs> does anybody speak German? Yeah. There we go, that's, <laughs> that's effect. Thank you very much, <laughs> audience. <laughs> uh, which uh, translates to defamiliarisation effect, uh, sometimes mistranslated as alienation effect, uh, mostly brought on from um, his ideas coming on from Marx. Um, so the way this was achieved, this way of keeping people aware that they're watching a piece of, of theatre, uh, various techniques, uh, you know, obviously you should be aware that you're always watching actors, so actors will often play multiple parts. Um, the characters themselves, they, they generally didn't have full, complete costumes. You'd have minimalist or representative, so uh, a military person would have sort of just, just a, a bit of insignia showing their rank, uh, that sort of thing. Or you'd have a particular hat or a mask to show you were that character. Uh, often the, shit, the, the set uh, was also very minimal, and that would be changed in full view of the audience, that sort of thing. Or we had things like uh, you, you read the stage directions as you were doing them. All of these things just to try and constantly keep you in the mindset that yes, this is this is stage, and this is I'm, I'm trying to you know critically look at what is happening here. Uh, also, and uh, uh, things like um, pointing out 
act as choices. Like when they, were, when they made a choice, they say, I could have done X, but instead I did Y. And then you carry on. This, this idea that you, you never allow a choice to be implicit. You're always making, making the point that you could have chosen something else. So how does this relate to games? Well, I, I think that this, this Brechtian sort of form uh, could be related to games to, to allow for a, a similar sort of thing. In fact, using sort of games as this political platform, maybe to portray some sort of message. Uh, now, how might this happen within games? Um, sort of idea as well. Obviously, the idea there is, is, is to make sure the player is constantly aware that they're playing a game. Uh, this actually isn't, isn't a terribly hard thing to do, I wouldn't say. Uh, a lot of, of game design has gone into uh, ways to uh, increase the presence of the player within the game. This idea that obviously your player is, is using some sort of controller, a keyboard or, or you know, an actual controller, um, and a lot of it goes into ways that you can reduce sort of, sort of like, uh, I'm gonna lost here. Um, so when, when you press the A button, the idea that you, you should feel that that is you jumping. Uh, or, you're, or you're making your character jump. The idea that your action on the controller has a direct impact on your character. So it's not terribly difficult to kind of undo that a bit, sort of like increase this distance between you, the player, putting using this interface into the game, and that action translating to something the character should do. It's not terribly different to increase sort of a, a gap in there. Uh, in particular, sort of a, a style of game that was uh, proposed. Uh, at Nine Worlds last year by uh, one Joseph Garvin, uh, or he, he might have coined the phrase anti-simulation. Uh, this idea that cro the control methods, you've got your arcade on one side of the spectrum and simulation on another. Obviously arcade, very simple mechanics to pick up. Simulation, very complex, very detailed, but they're quite close to what you have. He proposed anti-simulation games, uh, things like Quop or Surgeon Simulator. This idea that uh, the control method for those so sort of like they portray kind of realistic things like running a race or, or performing surgery, but the control method for those is, is much more fiddly and, and it requires you to do things in a very specific sequence and the timing is really fiddly. Any of you who've, who've seen Quop will, will, will know this. Sort of your, uh, the idea of having to control your, your thigh muscles and your calf muscles separately. I mean, in, in reality, when you're, when you're running, you, you just run, you just move forward, but, but in the game to run, You've got to do this weird little dance where, you, where you're pressing each of the buttons in a very specific pattern. I think that sort of, you know, like, by, uh, by, by making the, the, the controls fiddly, and uh, it's, it's very easy to make people very aware that I'm constantly playing a game because the controls are getting in the way. And now, certainly, though, this can be a, a difficult thing. It's, it's hard to not turn people off while you're doing this because there's a reason why people aim not to. Uh, but there are some... Uh, other sort of methods, what have we got in there? Yeah, so the method, again, kind of increases this idea that the player is not the character that they're in. The character that you are seeing or you're controlling is a different person to you. Uh, the game could, you know, directly address the player but not address the character. Uh, that's another sort of thing. And also making choices for now. These are some ideas, but I do have a couple of examples uh, just to highlight uh, where I feel that these sort of things have already come up. Uh, so, particularly with the idea that uh, you are not the character or keeping the distance between character, um, a while back actually I heard somebody talk about uh, genres in games. The, the, odd, the odd name of role-playing game, this idea that in RPGs you're, you're playing a role, but then they're saying, well, what game are you not playing a role in? What game, when are you ever yourself in a game? Surely you're always, even if you're Space Marine number 5073, you're, you're still playing the role of this Space Marine. Oh, there is one... Uh, game, or well, there, there are probably several games, but there's one game in particular uh, that brought me onto this idea. The Stanley Parable uh, makes this this sort of distinction between you and Stanley quite clear. I feel, in particular, there, there, there's one particular ending uh, or one particular part of the game which does this. After there's this, there's this sequence where sort of the narrator becomes aware or starts talking to you as a real person because you're you're not Stanley, and then he sort of there's this lecture on, on, on responsibly making choices uh, and then sort of you're going through and he's telling you okay but you have to you have to act like Stanley would act in these and then if you don't then the oh you can't actually see that there can you some um, fortune but if, if you don't uh, the the level starts breaking apart and it starts clipping through itself and you say oh no the narrative is collapsing because you're not following the story because you're using your choices irresponsibly 
Um, and at the end of that ending, you end up on top of this glass, glass ceiling looking down at Stanley. The narrator was talking to Stanley as though it was continuing the game. And you're moving around, but Stanley, Stanley isn't going anywhere because you're, you're now this, fully this separate entity to Stanley. Um, I mean, to be honest, a, a lot of my points actually come up in the Stanley parable uh, as a whole. Actually, the, the Stanley parable is what sort of drew, uh, took me on to this idea of using sort of Brechtian influences. And uh, Stanley parable in particular, I suppose that the message it's getting across is about choice in video games. Are our choices inherently pointless? Uh, and the idea that uh, sort of the, the, these choices can't exist without the player. And so, as you can see, that, like this kind of Thing, that without the player, Stanley isn't making a choice, and so, so the narrative cannot continue. It can't exist without the player making those choices, but if the choices are inherently pointless. It's, it's an interesting, uh, interesting thing to raise, and I think that uh, Stanley Powell does that very well. But uh, so, some of the other points, uh, right, addressing the player directly. Now, I um, also want to mention, uh, as I said, well, Stanley Powell is the, the main game that I sort of took this idea. I don't have many examples of games that do kind of do this. One, one game I found, uh, Only If. This is, this is, a, this is a, a really weird game. Um, mm -hmm. it's, it's available for free on Steam, um, and it takes like 15 minutes or so to play. Um, it's oh, you, you kind of, you, you're this guy who wakes up after a night drinking, when you're trapped in some weird place. Um, I don't know. So, but th there's one sequence uh, sort of in particular about uh, addressing the player. Um, you're, you're in this room, um, and th there's this voice coming across the radio at you, and it asks you this riddle, and then it starts counting down, and then when it finishes counting down, it, it, the, you get shot from somewhere. It's like, I, I was meant to do something, but there, there was, I, I, I clicked something, there was nothing for me to interact with. Um, but so I started the scene again, I clearly was meant to do something, and there's this little portrait that I didn't notice the last time, it said, uh, type something. And so he asked the question again, and I, I, I type in the answer, just as the, as the word, and like, some of those letters, interact with, with the control method. So the character is just uh, like jerking around as I'm typing in this word. And, but that is what it wanted me to do. It wanted me to progress to do that. Uh, clearly, this, this character wanted me as the player to do something but which wasn't necessarily what the character was doing. It was just, it was a very small, small time. And there's also another point uh, within this game where you're, you're walking around and suddenly the screen cuts to black and there's just text on there. I was like, oh, it was, that was, it was really jarring because, okay, this is clearly just meant directly to talk to me. And again, the same sort of thing happened. It wanted me to type in uh, an, another word as I was going on. It was like, it just sort of like drew me out of the game enough to make me think about sort of uh, what was happening and what was going on. Uh, and making choices explicit. Uh, now, uh, this, is a, this is a shot from uh, the Tales from the Borderlands, uh, Telltale, games already Telltale. Games are quite well known for, uh, for providing choices. Now. For the most part, they don't go for this. They do go for, for sort of like naturalistic styles and connecting with characters. But the one, the one interesting point is a uh, little, whenever, whenever you make a choice, a little box in, in the corner flashes up telling you that there is a consequence for your choice. Sometimes you don't even realize you're making it. You're just making choices. And somebody says, like, oh, so-and-so will remember that. You're thinking, oh, wh why are they remember? Like, oh, was, I, was that bad? Was I not meant to have done that? It's constantly showing you that your choice that, that when you are making choices i think i think that is the important point it's, it's never allowing you to implicitly make choices it's always saying no you're, you're doing something your actions have consequence because characters will react to these consequences ah. so that's sort of uh that's sort of it for these these, these brechtian uh styles and games as i was saying the interesting for for allowing sort of uh using games to, to provide a message, perhaps, or ultimately it's just, it's just something different, I feel. I mean, actually, personally, I, don't, I really can't stand Brechtian styles in theatre. Um, <laughs> I just, I, I'm, I'm, I'm big on Stanislavski. I love doing immersive, uh, naturalistic stuff. But I think just because in games, it's so rarely seen, and immersion is seen as so, so very key. I just think it's an interesting angle uh, to look at. I did briefly want to mention one other theatrical style, uh, the style of Antonin Artaud. It's weird. Um, it's, <laughs> it's really is 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 really weird. Um, our toast uh, style of theatre is called the theatre of cruelty. Uh, now, not cruelty in the sense of, of sadism or, or pain. It's it, um, what the, what the way it was described. It, it's more about using uh, raw emotion to aggressively assault the false or tear down the false reality. I don't know. Um, <laughs> 
it's again, it's very weird. Um, it's 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 a lot. It's very surrealist. Uh, it's it's very it's very raw and emotional, and it's about the experience that you claim. Um, actually, this is one that I, I'd say is is more already within games. You see a lot of uh, sort of personal games, uh, maybe some I, don't know, I suppose the, the old game sort of style has this this very raw, emotional, uh, personal perspective. Um, in particular, I would uh, just like to mention Stephen Lavelle. Uh, does this quite a lot. Um, in fact, one particular game by Stephen Lavelle called Slave of God. Uh, it's, a, it's a nightclub simulator uh, kind of thing, and you can kind of see, like, these, these are, I mean, the, the stills do not do it justice, because it always looks like that, except it shifts every time to the beat, and, like, the colours are pounding and, like, aggressively assaulting you, almost, with the colours and the music, and you, you, you're on the dance floor, and you, you, you kind of, you, you're, you take a drink to someone and then you see like a representation of, of bits of their life and you try and piece together what they're trying to tell you which you can only maybe half hear over the music and you meet someone on the dance floor and you dance a bit and there's pulsing lights and you make out with them for a bit and then you wander out into the, into the sunlight bleary and confused at the end of this and it's like it's this very raw and powerful thing. It's again told over sort of 10 minutes and that I think uh, perfectly sort of encapsulates this, this sort of um, Arto Arto's uh, theatrical style. So again, uh, lots more styles uh, possible in games. Uh, right, so to wrap all this up. Um, right, yes, uh, Brecht uh, thought that by defamiliarizing your audience, by making them aware that they are watching a piece of theater, it will allow them to retain a critical mindset. Uh, this critical mindset allows them to better analyze the messages within your piece, uh, encouraging them to then make changes within the world, having seen your piece. Um, I think that you can, uh, it's quite easy to defamiliarize your players from the game uh, by amplifying gaminess. Uh, oh, I completely forgot to mention, obviously. Um, certain games do accidentally do this, obviously, by amplifying their gaminess, but it's not the same as, as just forgetting or, or doing it poorly by accidentally like draw, breaking your immersion because something is, is poorly placed. Or, or the really annoying one is when you oh, what? when you go up to a quest and say, oh, what, what who, valiant adventurer, uh, who's been doing this for years? Uh, let, let me remind you how to swing your sword. Yes, uh, just go over there and press thine B button to attack. And it's like, it, it, it really draws you out, but it's not saying anything. It's, it's just kind of, it's just, I don't know, it's kind of lazy. It doesn't really work at all. But uh, if you're intentionally doing this, if you're intentionally amplifying the gaminess, um, I think, you know, you can get people to focus exactly on what they're doing at the time allowing you to bring forth uh, a uh, message. And that is that. Oh! Oh, how, how, did, how, did, how, did, how did that get there? Yes, the, the, the convention that I, that I happen to run is called uh, Nine Worlds. It's not having nine dubs yet. It's not having nine dubs. Video Brains uh, will be at Nine Worlds this year with uh, sort of having uh, nine short talks of nine minutes each. Nine dubs. Uh, there won't be nine doves. There will not be nine doves. It's not in the butt. It's not in the butt. Uh, that's. I have nine doves if anyone wants to buy them. Seventh, seventh to ninth of August in the Radisson at Heathrow. Please come along. <laughs>